You can imagine that, that because viruses are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Uh, the virus's evolution is dependent on the evolution of its host and vice versa. Viruses have probably had an enormous impact on how the trajectory of how we and other animals and vertebrates have evolved. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. On this episode, I'm going to be continuing my series on creationism and evolution. I'm going to be excited to talk to a real virologist to get the inside scoop on how viruses mingle with our DNA at the molecular level and how that impacts evolution. This is one of the evidences for evolution and common descent that I referenced in the series opening podcast. As always, if you enjoy my content, please hit like on your podcast app. Show the love. Join me on my Facebook group at The Rational View or come visit my website at therationalview.ca. Welkin Johnson, PhD, is a virologist with a particular interest in paleovirology. Dr. Johnson's research team works on molecular level virus host interactions and the impact of these interactions on the evolution of both the viruses and their hosts. A Michigander by birth, he attended University of California, Berkeley, where he obtained his bachelor's degree in microbiology and immunology. After working for a year as a lab tech at UC San Francisco, Welkin moved to Boston, where he obtained his PhD in molecular biology and microbiology from Tufts University School of Medicine. He was a postdoctoral fellow and later faculty in the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics at Harvard Medical School. In 2011, he joined the faculty of Boston College, where he currently serves as the chair of the biology department. He also serves on the board of scientific advisors for the National Cancer Institute and is on the editorial boards of several journals. Dr. Johnson, welcome to The Rational View. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank you for coming on. Could you tell me a little bit about, uh, expand on your career path and how you came to be interested in, in virology and paleovirology? Um, I, I think that my career path was pretty much uh, going wherever the sort of the current took me. To be perfectly honest, I, um, I, I didn't, my fam, there were no scientists in my family. I didn't grow up realizing I wanted to be a scientist. It's really something that sort of, I mean, I always liked science and I did well in it in school, but I don't know that I had a, I don't think I really understood what a scientist was. To me, like a lot of people, scientists was somebody, Mr. Arnold was my biology teacher. That was my idea of a scientist. Um, so it was really at UC Berkeley. You know, there's a huge science community there. Um, I think partway, halfway through college is when it really started to hit me that I was interested in microbiology, and interested in viruses. But the, the choice to be an academic scientist, and this is, I'm sorry, it's not this great story of somebody who just loved science and wanted to be a scientist. It was more just a moment on campus realizing that I really liked being in academia. I liked being on a campus. I liked that sort of community. Um, and, and this was, this coincided almost exactly with the, with the rise of biotech. So at the time that I was an undergrad there, Cetus and Chiron, Genentech, all these companies, most of which are now gone or been renamed or something, but biotech was booming. So anybody majoring in science, if you weren't thinking medical school, the other thing you were thinking about was biotech. Um, but I, I decided after graduating to take, to work as a research tech and just sort of think about what it was I wanted to do. And so I went to work for a woman named uh, Jenny LaVale mm -hmm. at UC San Francisco. And, and one of the things she was working on was, was herpes virus infections of the eye. And so that's how I started to get interested in virology. And then I saw the graduate students and postdocs giving seminars and doing all this cool science. And I said, you know what, I, I don't want to be a tech. I want to be one of them. Um, and then again, the wind just sort of blew me in the right direction. I thought, well, if I'm going to be a scientist, I should go to the East Coast for a few years. So I applied to graduate school out here, got into Tufts. And then for the last 30 years, I kept thinking, I'm going to go back to California one day, but life just sort of happened. And then my wife in Boston, which is, which is why I stayed here to postdoc, and then an opportunity arose 
uh, at Harvard Medical School to be faculty there. Um, and later an invitation to come visit Boston College. And I loved it because Boston College was what I pictured 30 years before at Berkeley. It's, an under, it's a campus full of undergraduates, the science, the arts, everything is in one place. Um, and so for me personally, I like that, that environment. Medical schools are great, a lot of research gets done there, but I like that environment where you're, <clears throat> you can do cutting edge science, but you're also working with people just starting out in that pathway. So undergraduates exploring what they want to do. Um, so you, you, you enjoy teaching? I do. I do like teaching. I had not done much of it. I'd mostly done graduate level teaching before coming to Boston College, so I really had to learn uh, on the fly. It's a, sort of a different thing to teach undergraduates. But yes, I do like teaching. Yeah, yeah. So um, can you maybe summarize at, at a low level the research questions that your lab is focused on uh, for, for a general audience? Yeah, the... I suppose, I suppose in the most basic sense, I and, and actually a lot of virologists um, are often interested in getting down to the molecular level details of how viruses interact with hosts. So when a virus infects a cell, so viruses, I think everyone should understand they're different from bacteria and other sorts of pathogens and that a virus is by definition 100% dependent on a host cell. A virus is basically a genetic program that infects a cell, and then it uses all the machinery of the cell to produce more virus. So viruses take advantage of everything that the cell already does to make it to make their proteins, to express their genes, to traffic proteins, to assemble them into a virus. It basically uses the cell and turns it into a virus-producing machine. And so there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of sort of molecular interactions between viral genes and viral proteins and host genes and host proteins that determine collectively how successful a virus is at infecting a cell and spreading to the next cell. And so, so we're very interested in those functional interactions at the molecular level. What makes my lab a little different is we like to combine that sort of functional study with evolutionary analysis as well. So we're, we're interested in understanding how those interactions between the virus and the host have evolved and adapted over the course of thousands or millions of years. Right? You can imagine that, that because viruses are ubiquitous, they're everywhere, uh, the virus's evolution is dependent on the evolution of its host and vice versa. Viruses have probably had an enormous impact on how the trajectory of how we and other animals, invertebrates, have evolved. Okay, okay. So some people call that paleovirology. That's sort of the buzzword that you hear now. And I'll, I'll just add one more thing. I, I think people don't think about this much, but if you if you read philosophy of biology, people like Ernst Mayer will talk about how biology is really two disciplines. It's functional biology and it's comparative or evolutionary biology, and, and they they tend to use very different methods and approaches. One does molecular level experiments, the other tries to infer the past through comparative analysis. So my lab and labs like mine really try to put those two things together. We try to combine experimental biology with evolutionary biology. Okay. So I came across a review paper that you had authored on endogenous retroviruses in evolution. From my basic understanding, retroviruses are viruses that transcribe their genetic code into the DNA of the host. Could you explain a little bit about what is an endogenous retrovirus and why are they important to evolution? Yeah, I, so the the so I'll start with the retrovirus. So the 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 what makes retroviruses sort of unique among viruses is that the let me back up a second. So all organisms, all cellular organisms, including human beings, have, and bacteria and trees, elephants, all cellular organisms have DNA as their genetic material. Viruses are different because while some viruses have DNA as their genetic material, quite a few different kinds of viruses have RNA as their genetic material. The current SARS-CoV-2, the virus that's causing the COVID pandemic, has an RNA genome, for example. The kind of virus that I'm interested in, retroviruses, and the most famous retrovirus, or the best known is HIV-1, the virus that causes AIDS, are interesting because they actually do both. The virus 
a particle has an RNA genome in it as its genetic material, but when it infects a host cell, it converts that RNA genome into a DNA genome and it inserts it into the host wow. cell. It'll insert that DNA into the host cell chromosome. So now the cell within its own genes, within its own DNA, has a set of genes that express a virus. It's basically as if the virus has now given the host cell a set of genes that encode the virus itself. I don't, that's the best way I can think to put it. So they're like zombie virus cells. So because the DNA is inserted in the host chromosome, it's really now a part of the cellular chromosome. If that cell divides and replicates its genome, the viral genome will get replicated with it. Both daughter cells will also have copies of the viral genome. That is if the virus doesn't kill the cell or the immune system doesn't kill the cell. Um, and most retroviruses that we know of, things like HIV-1, they infect uh, somatic cells, cells of the, of the circulatory system, for example, tissue cells. But what can happen during an infection is once in a while a virus, a viral particle might bump up against a germline cell, a cell that's going to become a gamete, like a, a sperm or an oocyte. And so when that happens, the viral DNA is now in a cell that will also get handed on to the next generation. Right? So an endogenous virus, retrovirus, is, is a sequence that arose by infection and insertion of viral DNA into a germline cell, but from there wound up in the organism's gene pool. And even though it's thought that this is probably a rare event during any given infection, over the course of vast evolutionary time, it's happened millions of times. And so the human genome itself has maybe a 200, 300,000 viral sequences in it. So there's 200,000 viruses in the human genome. Yeah, it's not really the viruses. It's their genetic material. It's what they've left behind. Uh, in most cases, that material is, is no longer capable of expressing virus. Uh, if it was, it would be detrimental, right? So, so natural selection has probably weeded out the ones that would produce virus and actually kill the host, right? So the, um, but from the point of view of paleovirology, what that means is, is our genomes, and in fact, the genomes of all vertebrate species, um, have thousands of these sequences that have been, that represent viral outbreaks and viral epidemics and viral pandemics of the past. So you can retrace wow. the history of viruses that have arisen and spread going back, um, you know, you can do it really easily within the last few million years, but you can still detect traces of virus sequences. They're still recognizable out past 50 million, even 100 million years old. Wow. So we probably have sequences in our genomes that represent viruses not that infected humans, but viruses that might have infected ancestors to modern humans. And you can still recognize what the viruses are, the 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 DNA patterns are similar enough from ancient viruses that you know what these viruses were. Yeah, they bear strong similarity to, to modern retroviruses. So we can, not only can we recognize them, but the, the cool part, the functional part, is you can often reconstruct the viral genes. So we, we don't reconstruct whole virus, but we can take individual viral genes, express those viral proteins in the lab, and study how they interact in cells and things like that. So it's in theory possible to, to sort of find sequences from where the virus itself might have been extinct a million years ago, reconstruct one of those viral proteins and actually figure out what the receptor was that that virus must have used to get into cells a million years ago. Wow, so this is like Jurassic Park of viruses. Yeah, sort of, except there's no, um, you're not making an actual, vi you know, what you do is you sort of focus on individual viral genes. We don't reconstruct the whole virus that actually might be very difficult to do, and I don't know that it would tell you much. Um, so through sequence, I, people, the, the metaphor is, they're thought of as molecular fossils, endogenous retroviruses, inverted genomes are sort of analogous to fossils embedded in geological strata. Right? So a, an endogenous retrovirus that's, say, found only in modern humans 
would be much younger than an endogenous retrovirus that was found in humans and chimpanzees. Right? So if it's only in humans, it, it's something that infected a common ancestor in our recent history. If the same sequence is in a chimp genome and a human genome, then it's something that would have infected a common ancestor that led both to modern chimpanzees and modern humans, which makes some very nice markers for reconstructing evolutionary trees as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So as you may know, I'm doing a series of podcasts right now looking at the polarized issue of evolutionism and creationism. Um, now, many creationists feel that the data scientists collect could be reinterpreted to favor a young earth uh, and special creation. What from your work uh, have you found <clears throat> that is there anything that might support that conclusion if it was reinterpreted differently or is the evidence just strongly supporting evolution? I, it would be very difficult to, for me to reframe it in a context that wasn't based on evolutionary theory. It's, um, I'm not even sure where to begin. The, the, the enormous amount of data and the way it's distributed among species would be incredibly hard to explain, say, by coincidence. Right? For, for you and I to have a sequence in common with a chimpanzee, the simplest possible explanation is that it, it, not just the same sequence, but it located in exactly the same spot in the genome. The simplest explanation is that it infected a common ancestor that gave rise to both modern humans and modern chimpanzees. Um, I don't know how you could recast it to support the idea of a young earth. That's an interesting challenge. <laughs> One of my sort of a mentor of mine is a man named Elio Schechter. He does a really, he used to do a really known, well-known blog called, um, small things considered. It was about microbes and viruses. And as part of his blog, he had a feature called Talmudic questions. They were questions that no one had an answer for, but in trying to think about them, it, it helped you think through certain subjects or how they work. And I, I would think that would be a Talmudic question. If you had to make your data fit the idea of the young earth, what, what, how many loop hoops would you have to jump through to make that work? My guess is it would take a lot of um, hand waving and a lot of shifting to try to come up with a way to make it fit that, that theory or that idea. Yeah, I mean, without I think it's been said that you know without the framework of natural selection, nothing in biology makes sense, uh, and the predictive power of the theory of, of natural selection, the theory of evolution. Is, is basically behind what you're doing in resurrecting these paleoviral genes. Is that uh, a fair statement? Yeah, yeah. It's, that's true. It's, um, you know, I, virologists, I think, well, I'm, so, I'm going to have the self-centered or the virologist-centered view. I think virologists uh, find it very easy to accept the principles of natural selection because viruses they do a couple of things that are very Darwinian. Viruses produce very large populations and because they, like you can grow millions of viruses in a, in a, in a flask, for example. And they also have high mutation rates. So between those two things, having a large population and a high mutation rate, they can adapt very quickly. So you can see, you can see the principles of natural selection happening uh, either in the laboratory or or in a natural infection. If you're studying an animal or, or patients who've been infected, you can, like an HIV infected person, you can actually sample the virus over time and see, you can actually track and see the sequencing, the sequence of the virus changing over time. And you can even go in the lab and, and prove that those sequence changes are what are allowing the virus to adapt to the host. Hmm. So at least at least on a microevolution scale, virologists deal with this all the time. It's almost instinctively we have to incorporate it into our work. So you you mentioned that uh, in your paleovirology you can track viruses going back 
tens of millions, even a hundred million years. So this um, tends to support common ancestry very strongly. Uh, most creationists are focused on common ancestry of humans and apes, but in scientists, when we talk about common ancestry, we're talking about all the way back to the first cells, the first unicellular organisms. Uh, how far back does uh, endo do endogenous retroviruses go in terms of supporting common descent? Is Are there endogenous retroviruses that you know, span plant and animal kingdoms, for example, or is that too far back? That's probably too far back. So retroviruses, to the best of my knowledge, retroviruses are largely found in vertebrates. So, so not in plants or bacteria or archaea, uh, but there are, or insects and things like that, but there are retrovirus-like things. There are viruses like them that infect plant species and insect species and things like that. I don't know that there's one kind of virus that would span the kingdoms in such a way that you could go that far back and unite the kingdoms. The, the evidence that unites the different kingdoms is very strong. It's the, you know, it's the shared use of DNA, uh, almost identical genetic code with a few little variations on the theme, the use of tRNA and ribosome. You probably talked about all of this uh, before. No, not in a lot of detail. <laughs> yeah. With retroviruses, what happens is this signal of endogenous retroviruses, the sequence in your genome will accumulate mutations over time just by random chance. So when you get more than 100 million years back, the sequence now has changed so much that it becomes more and more difficult. Just like in the older a fossil it is, the more likely that it has fallen apart or decayed. Um, but the... Retroviruses are also, now, now we're getting into the realm of, of sort of philosophy of origins. It's thought that re retroviruses might have actually played a very important role in the origins of, of cellular life because the, the common thinking is that the pre-cellular world probably was RNA first, not DNA. Hmm. And then when, when DNA arose in the early life of the planet, um, it may really have been something like a retrovirus that was that played a key role in converting things from RNA to DNA. Um, the person to talk to about, there's a man named Eugene Koonin, uh, who thinks very deeply and talks and writes quite a bit about um, theories about how, where did the last universal common ancestor come from and the role that viruses might have played in that process. Interesting. I'll have to I'll have to look this person up. That sounds very cool. So, tell me a little bit more about how um, viruses affect our evolution or interplay with um, with species to to affect their evolution. And you, you say that viruses and hosts um, co-evolve in some way. Can you can you explain that process a bit? Yeah. So so. All viruses could be thought of as being um, agents of natural selection, right? So, so a virus that parasitizes a host is putting selective pressure on that host species to adapt to the virus, to, to, to uh, evolve to resist infection by the virus or to evolve to resist disease from infection by the virus. So all viruses can be forces of natural selection. The vertebrate immune uh, system very much must have been influenced by viruses, right? The genes that make antibodies, the genes that make T cell receptors and things like that, are probably have evolved over four or 500 million years in the, in the environment that included viruses attacking the host. So all viruses are agents of natural selection. Retroviruses, because they can insert, they can add genetic material to the host genome, retroviruses play a second role in evolution in that they contribute genetic material to the host genome. And a lot of times that material might just sort of sit there and do nothing, but it is there for natural selection to repurpose. Just to clarify a little bit what you're saying. So <clears throat> all viruses apply evolutionary pressure on their hosts and that evolutionary pressure 
is basically by killing off uh, hosts uh, that are not immune effectively. So that pressure is, is mainly a, a, a selection pressure, selecting against uh, hosts that are, are susceptible effectively. Whereas the retroviruses are both applying the selection pressure as well as adding genetic material for um, the randomness of um, mutation. Is that is that a correct in- interpretation? That's 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 very good. Yeah. And it, in fact, to be a selective pressure, the virus wouldn't even have to kill the host. It would just have to make it slightly less likely to reproduce than an un, uninfected host to have an evolutionary True. pressure. Right. The, um, it just makes, you know, if it makes the host sick. If this host has trouble finding a mate or has trouble raising offspring or something like that, that would be enough pressure. I imagine it, it's much harder to prove, but I imagine that eventually we'll figure out ways that viruses have also affected the evolution of behavior. You can imagine that learning to avoid viruses or evolving to have an instinct to avoid viruses might actually be something that could evolve in response to viruses too. Getting back to the second point though, the, the retroviral insertion uh, it can be a source of mutation. It can also be the viral material itself can get repurposed by evolution to have a host function. And probably one of the most, um, one of the earliest examples was was a, a discovery and there were wild mice on a squab farm in California. And scientists back in the 70s and early 80s noticed that this population of mice had a retrovirus circulating in it causing, causing a cancer-like disease but some of the mice were resistant to that virus. And when the technology came along to map and identify the resistant genes in the mice, it turned out that it was a viral gene that basically been repurposed by evolution to be antiviral. So, so the, the viral gene that had become endogenized essentially functioned as a, as a inhibitor of future virus infection. I don't know if I said that very clearly, but that's a, um, and then I, I think the most stunning example that people know about um, are the placental syncytins. So in mammals, mammals have a placenta that supports the, the uh, development of the fetus. And that placental structure turns out that one very important part of its development uh, involves proteins that several million years ago were actually from a virus, right? So there's there's two genes in the human genome called syncytin one and syncytin two that very clearly trace back to you know probably I forget 20 30 million years ago a retroviral infection. These retroviral genes that got left behind turned out to be useful to the host, and they became incorporated into the development of the placenta. Wow. So it's, it's really, you could argue that, that the evolution, the appearance of the different mammalian uh, classes um, very much depended on this chance interaction with retroviruses in the distant past. That's really cool. So mammals owe their existence to uh, an ancient uh, case of the flu. Basically. <laughs> it's worth pointing out to people that I mentioned earlier, there's a couple hundred thousand endogenous retrovirus sequences in the human genome but none of them are capable of making virus anymore. They're mutated, they're defective. But interestingly, there's, a, there's maybe a couple dozen of them where one of the viral genes is still intact. So they can't make the whole virus, but they still have the ability to make an individual viral protein, some protein that the virus used as part of its replication. And the fact that those things are still there and have been preserved for so long in the human genome suggests that natural selection is preserving them. That for some reason, the reason those viral genes have not decayed or acquired inactivating mutations means they're probably serving some sort of function. And in most cases, we don't, know, we don't yet know what that function is. Is it possible, now no, I, this is my ignorance talking, is it possible that making viral proteins in the cell, I mean, this is effectively what vaccines do, is it possible that this is training the immune system to, in some way? I, I don't think so. Um, 
Well, on one level, it's true. So they're not viral proteins anymore. They're now our proteins. They're self proteins. So you're, to the right. extent they train your immune system, they train your immune system not to attack them. So the placental syncytins, uh, it would be, it would be disadvantageous if if the mother's own immune system were to attack the proteins that are involved in placental development. So in that sense, they train the immune system to tolerate self. That's probably true. Okay. Interesting. But but the first example I talk about in the mouse, they can become part of the immune system. So when a viral protein serves to interfere with viral infection, it actually becomes a weapon in the immune system to prevent further viral infection. It could be binding to receptors so that the virus can't uh, infect, perhaps. That's exactly. The best established cases are where the, the viral entry protein, now that it's endogenized, masks the receptor so that its viral counterparts can no longer bind to that receptor and infect the host. That's, that's exactly the, the, the best known example. So just just another question and clarification. So you say that all of the um, endogenous retroviruses have been deactivated by some sort of a, a mutation in the viral genome that's uh, incorporated into the cell. So I assume this would be almost a prerequisite for it to become endogenized. Uh, do you think that this happens, this is the only way that it actually can become endogenized is with a, a mutation that that inactivates it. I don't suspect it would success, result in a successful fetus or a successful being if it, all of its cells had active virus in it. I, I, I can imagine two ways that it could happen. I think what the, the most obvious way is what you're just talking about. If the virus gets into the germline but is producing infectious deadly virus, that organism is unlikely to survive and reproduce. So you'll never, that endogenous retrovirus won't become part of the gene pool. That's, that's almost certainly true. Um, but, but the other interesting thing is that the humans and other organisms have evolved mechanisms for silencing foreign DNA when it shows up in our genome. So, so a lot of times when these things are first acquired, even if they're still capable of making virus, the, the, there are molecular mechanisms that might turn those viral genes off mm. Mm -hmm. so that they, so in that case, you can imagine that endogenized sequence, even if it could make virus, if it's mostly been, if the genes have mostly been turned off, they could probably be tolerated, get into the gene pool. And that would sort of buy evolution some time to inactivate them before they got turned on again by, by chance or by some external stimulus. Um, Actually, that's that's I hadn't thought about that earlier when we were talking about how they've impacted evolution. But it's quite clear that almost all organisms, in addition to having traditional immunity like antibodies and T cells, have sort of innate mechanisms for preventing the replication or the expression of, of sequences that don't look like their own genome. Wow, that's interesting. It's a, it's a huge field. It's, you know, it's, there's so much work to be done. There's so much opportunity for, for people getting into the sciences, getting into the field of virology, because it's almost limitless, the numbers of sort of genes and questions you can ask about how viruses have affected cells, how they interact with cells, how they interact with whole organisms. And of course, now, thanks to this pandemic, everybody's getting, a, getting sort of a lesson in population genetics, epidemiology, concepts like herd immunity and things like that, too. Yes, yes, it's a, a good opportunity, a good le learning opportunity, I guess, for for all of us. I think we're finding out more than we want to in a lot of cases. <laughs> I'm, I'm old enough to remember the first SARS um, Outbreak, and I, I tell you, when we started hearing about this one, I thought it was going to be the same sort of thing. It was going to be sort of flare up; it might spread a bit and then go away. I, I did not expect almost two years later to be sitting here and still dealing with this. Mm -hmm. We've we've learned a lot. Yeah, I think a lot of that was the, the difference. I guess was from what I hear, mainly because of the the asymptomatic spread of this one and making it more difficult to uh, to track. 
yeah, it was better, a, not as often symptomatic and probably somehow just better adapted or pre, by coincidence, better at spreading in humans. And the more it spreads in humans, the better it adapts to humans as well. That's the, um, it's actually when, when I talk about vaccines with people, I, I think sometimes people forget that the, the vaccine, we think of it in terms of protecting ourselves, but really what it's doing is it's, it's preventing this enemy from learning, adapting to humans and spreading in, in the human population. Really, You know, if you don't, if you don't protect yourself from the virus in a sense, you're aiding and abetting the enemy. Right. By allowing it to infect you, it's learning how to replicate in humans. It's learning how to better spread in humans. Right? So the, I, you can see where I come down on this issue, but I do think that vaccination mm -hmm. and, and mask wearing and all the different things that people, strategies people come up with to stop it from spreading are what you have to do when a virus invades you. The same as a, an army invading your country, you, you have to. You have to think of it in terms of you're protecting everyone around you, not just yourself. Sorry, I'm wandering off topic mm -hmm. there. It's no, no, this is also very interesting to, I'm sure, to everyone to have an expert on virology to, to, to answer some of these questions. I mean, and I'm, I'm very interested in, in this as well. Um, what do you see as the as the end game for COVID? Where Where is this going uh, now that it's going into endemic stage? You know, does it have to adapt to humans? Do we have to get the 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 less viral um, forms of these, the less damaging forms, to emerge for this to become to go away, or is is it something that can still be eliminated? I, I'm so glad you asked that question. If I could be free to speculate, please. You know, I, it's it's always hard for a scientist, right? We don't want to get caught out saying that we said something was true or false and then we're wrong. Um, I think most experts expect that this virus, sort of like the flu virus, um, will become an endemic virus of humans or other coronavirus. We have other coronaviruses that are not, you know, they cause things like a common cold. And it's possible that if we could look back in time, we might see that the origins of those other coronaviruses were similar to SARS. Maybe they started out as a cross-species transmission and adapted to humans. And I think so. I think most experts are predicting that what we might start to see is sort of spread out occasional waves of this virus coming back through um, as it becomes endemic. The part of your question I like, and where where I think I, I would hope that we continue to think about it, is is it actually does that mean it's not possible to drive this virus to extinction in the human? population. I think most experts will cautiously say probably not. I mean, flu, we haven't been able to get rid of flu, even though we have flu vaccines and things like that. On the other hand, we got rid of smallpox virus, right? The smallpox virus was driven to extinction in humans. Um, and so I like to think that there's probably some entrepreneurs out there. There's the, the Steve Jobs or the Elon Musk of virology, somebody out there who is thinking about ways that technologies could be combined and not give up on the idea that we might be able to figure out ways to eliminate uh, the virus. But that's, that's really just getting into the realm of futuristic speculation. I don't think, I don't think we should rule anything out. Well, I think on, on Star Trek, the next generation, the, you know, the, the, the cold virus and the flu virus have been eliminated. And, and it's always a surprise when someone gets a stuffy nose well, there you go. If they can do it on Star Trek, I'm sure we can. <laughs> so then this leads me into a, a common question that I ask um, my guests. What kind of uh, science fiction are you interested in? Do you have uh, a favorite uh, show or book that, that you'd like to share? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll first say I, I'm a scientist, but I like all sorts of fiction. I've read fiction my whole life. Um so I'm not, uh, I read science fiction probably as much as anything else, but I wouldn't say it's my only or my favorite genre. Um, I like a lot of the classics. I, I, um, I like short stories. I like some of the old stuff that used to be come out from like uh, Isaac Asimov and people like that. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Ray Mm -hmm. Bradbury, I remember reading as a kid. Dune, I remember reading Dune as a kid and I couldn't figure it out at all. And then finally later as an adult, I read it and actually loved it and plowed through most of the book. Um, But I don't, I guess I like speculative fiction in general. I, I, people don't often call him science fiction, but I, I often think of Kurt Vonnegut as being a science fiction writer, and he also happens to be one of my favorite authors. Oh, interesting. You know, science fiction can be interesting because it's um, really well-written science fiction, of course, is a joy to read, but even poorly written science fiction can still be very enjoyable um, because of the ideas that, that it presents. That's what that's what I like. I, I like the when I when I encounter a new idea or makes me something that makes me think about uh, the world in a different way. Uh, that that's my favorite part about science fiction. The guy who coined cyberpunk. What, what's that author's name? Uh, Gibson. Gibson. I'd say Gibson is one that I, I've really enjoyed over the years, and it's been interesting how his fiction. He didn't get stuck in one sort of era. His fiction. His science fiction has sort of kept up with developments and is surprisingly uh, continued to be relevant. And that's always been a, that's been an interesting surprise to me. The, his most recent series of books is very different from sort of the stuff he wrote early on, but I liked them all. Very cool. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show, Dr. Johnson. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, and uh, I'm sure... Um, your insights will be of great use to, to the audience here. So thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to send you uh, a Ration View t-shirt for, for being on the show. Uh, you, you can wear that and, and show it off to your students. So uh, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks very much. I appreciate what you're doing. Keep up the good work. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my patron page at patron.podbean.com slash The Rational View. Thanks for listening.